I don't know if aging can be reversed or not, biological aging like as a whole. Certainly we have to say it's theoretically possible. I think those people can almost all get 15 years of quality life back. Then if you fix that, if you reverse those, maybe you can reverse everything else. Welcome to the Seamland podcast. I'm your host Seam Lund and our guest today is Matt Caberlane. Matt is a PhD and researcher in the biology of aging. He's one of the world's most renowned names in longevity, life extension and healthy aging. This episode is brought to you by the Biohacker Center, your home for all biohacking gadgets, longevity supplements and functional foods. You can get everything starting with spermidine, liposomal NMN, magnesium as well as red light therapy devices, blue light blocking glasses and water filters. The Biohacker Center is a company I'm personally involved with and invested in. If you want to support this channel while providing yourself with the supplements and devices you are going to get anyway, then the Biohacker Center is the best place to do so. Head over to biohackercenter.com and use the code SEAMLUND for a 10% discount. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. When you look into like the internet and do some research about aging and the biology, biology of aging, then you've been like around pretty much almost since the beginning of, of that, uh, at least like in the modern, in the past few decades yeah. of um, researching about, you know, the biology of aging actually, and how does it work and what is, what causes aging, etc. So yeah, I'm definitely super excited to have you on the uh, show. And uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about, or we can start with like, you know, what has been some of the, you know, shift over the past few decades in terms of the aging uh, research and what have, have we like, you know, seen any like massive breakthroughs in the last few years? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe where I would start is to say, so you're right. I mean, I've, I haven't been around since the beginning of aging research, but I've been around for a while. I, uh, I actually started in the field uh, around 1998 when I was a second year graduate student uh, at MIT. I started working with Lenny Garenti. And so maybe the way to frame, you know, the answer to your, your question is to start there and say, I think that was a really um, interesting and exciting time in the field because you know, prior to, I would say the 19, about 1990, most of the work in the field had been fairly observational, right? People would see that certain things changed with age, hormone levels changed with age, things like that, functional measures changed, but we didn't really have any insight into the mechanisms. And by that, I mean, genetic, biochemical, molecular, and that really all started to change, I would say, in the 1990s, um, when people started to identify genes that affected lifespan. So I feel very fortunate to have come into the field at that time, because there was a big burst in knowledge as people started to do genome-wide screens and things like that to find um, mutations that affected lifespan, and then started to characterize how that was working from a very mechanistic level. So really, I think much of what we understand about the biology of aging today, the hallmarks of aging, for example, you know, really derived from that work that was happening in the late 90s, early 2000s, where people were starting to identify, you know, pathways and mechanisms of, of aging. Um, a couple of things I would say that I think are, are, are kind of fundamentally now accepted in the field, but which really weren't when I started. One was that there are evolutionarily conserved mechanisms of aging. In other words, the biology of aging is, you know, to a large extent similar, if not identical across different animals. That really wasn't appreciated, I think, when I, when I started in the field. Um, and then also the fact that that we can, it appears that we can actually intervene in the biology of aging and have a positive impact during adulthood. Again, I think, you know, when I came into the field, there, there was, it was sort of the perception that you had to start any treatment to affect light longevity or health span. You had to start early on to get those benefits. We now know from multiple examples, and I think rapamycin is, is one of the best characterized, but there are now multiple examples where you can actually start an intervention in middle age and get many, if not all of the benefits that you get from starting that intervention in young age. That's not true for everything. And we may want to get into this. I think, you know, caloric restriction is an example where it seems as though the benefits that you get, at least in laboratory animals, are much larger when you start earlier in life. But at least for some things, you can get a significant benefit. There are, there are you know, partial rejuvenation properties, at least functionally from some of these things, which is super exciting. I think, you know, from a translational perspective, being able to eventually bring these into the real world to have an impact, um, it's much more appealing, obviously, if you if you have an intervention, you can start in middle age, as opposed to something that, you know, very, very young people have to have to take. So there, there have been huge 
advances, lots of things I didn't talk about. But but to me, those are a couple of things that that I think have been particularly important and and you know, in some ways have been a paradigm shift in the way we think about the biology of aging. Mm, yeah. Yeah, like uh, that's usually like people you know think that aging is like i mean i i, I like also like david sinclair kind of uh alludes it to that uh, aging is some sort of a program or it's like like genetically you know encoded into our bodies to age and uh, die and a lot of the research you know i don't know what do you think like does the new research like challenge that idea or does it support it or what is the, what is like aging some sort of a program that just you know happens that we can't do anything about it or is it yeah like you can modify it yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the data are clear. You can modify the biology of aging. There's no, really no question about that. I think some of this um, confusion about is aging programmed really comes down to what we mean when we say that word programmed. So the programmed aging theories really have a very specific definition. And that means, so, so people who argue that aging is programmed are really arguing that natural selection has acted to cause aging. In other words, that this is an evolutionarily selected process and the genes that limit longevity or that drive the biology of aging have been selected for that function, okay? I don't think anybody disagrees that there are genes that affect the biology of aging. And if they do, they're just ignorant of the literature. I mean, there's that, that, it would be silly to even say that because we, we have hundreds of examples now of single genes that can modulate the, the biology of aging. So it's clear that aging is affected by genetics. Um, whether or not those genes were selected for that reason, we can have a debate about that. I don't think you can actually answer that question. I think there are some cases we can point to, like senescence in leaves, where clearly there has been natural selection acting to cause that senescence process, and it is an important um, component of the fitness of those organisms. Whether that's true in mammals, I, I don't see a lot of evidence to support the idea that aging has been selected for, but that's sort of irrelevant to the question of whether genetics controls aging. It does. Mm. Um, I think it is an open question in humans and in other animals. You know, if you were to say like what percent of longevity is genetically controlled versus environmentally affected, that's a little bit harder to answer. The estimates, I think, right now are about three-fourths environment, one-fourth genetics in humans. Um, it could be different. It's going to be different in other animals. But, you know, those are squishy numbers. It's really hard to, to, to quantify that. Again, though, I think it's important for people to really just appreciate the, the big picture here, right? That That there is a biology of aging. <laughs> it is under genetic control and environmental control, and we can modulate that. I think it's an open question how much we can modulate it. In other words, is there an upper limit? So, you know, we can't get past that. That's an open question. Some people will say that, you know, the maximum achievable lifespan for a human is somewhere around 140 years. You know, that remains to be determined. Um, but it's clear that we can, in fact, modulate the biological aging process. We can dramatically affect health span, dramatically affect lifespan in every animal where we've tried um, in the laboratory. So I, I, I just don't really see any rationale for, for, for you know, why, why anybody would even argue that, that, that aging isn't genetically controlled. It clearly is. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so far, no one has, has lived uh, until 140 at least they say or like you know some some like these monks say that they're like 300 years old or something <laughs> but yeah but <laughs> yeah we need to document that right i mean i think yeah. you know the the longest lived documented person uh is about 122 years and a few months there's even some debate there whether you know she actually lived that long or or not i think the second longest person is about 118 years so yeah i mean it seems like it seems likely that if you look at the maximum lifespan that a person has lived to that we can be confident of it's right around 120 years mm, yeah, yeah and uh, i think like now they say that the person who is going to live until 150 has already been born and when you look at like the average increase in life expectancy over the past few you know the century then it has been climbing but that's you know mostly the kind of the healthcare and uh, yeah. removing bacterial infections and infant mortality and those things uh, so yeah it's hard to tell <laughs> because yeah yeah and i mean want... right you're right some people will say that that the first 150 year old has been born i don't think there's any i don't think there's any good evidence to support that it's possible it's you know it's kind of like predicting 
you know, escape longevity, escape velocity, right? And this is a little bit cynical, but the reality is there's really very little downside to people who want to make those predictions because if they're wrong, they're going to be dead before they come true anyway. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, maybe uh, I, I would like to be optimistic and say, yeah, hopefully the first 150 year old has already been born. There's some reason for optimism to be, certainly to believe that's possible. Um, that you can also point to reasons to think that that's probably unlikely, right? I mean, I I I think we just don't know at this point. Um, but I do believe that we have a, a, an enormous opportunity by targeting the biology of aging in humans, even just given what we know today, to have a significant impact on healthy longevity. We're probably not talking. 30, 40 years, we're probably talking 10, 20 years. That's still a big deal, right? And if we could get, you know, an extra 15 years of health span, maybe lifespan for most people, that's that's pretty significant. And I think that is well within the realm of, of feasibility, given what we know about the biology of aging today and a reasonable extrapolation of where, where that probably will go in the next few years. Mm, yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, I think it's yeah, very hard to actually reach you know, into the 140s and 50s, uh, unless you are doing some sort of, you know, genetic engineering or some like a new breakthrough technology that we don't know exists. That's yet. right. But yeah. Right now, I think right, that's right. right now, it's most of these like, you know, calorie restriction and the different supplements and exercise and healthy healthcare and those things that are just going to increase the health span and the life expectancy, maybe like, yeah, 10 or 20 years. Yeah. And I mean, it's still good if people are on average are going to live until 100. I think that that's, would be pretty massive uh, victory. Yeah, and let me just expand a little bit on what you said, because I think there is a little bit of a misperception about genetic engineering, right? So, you know, there are people out there who will claim that, you know, genetic engineering for human longevity has the potential to have very large effects, you know, on health span and, and lifespan. And I agree, there is a potential there. But even if you, let's just say you had a technology that allowed you to make any change to the human genome completely safe anywhere you wanted to, it's not clear from what we know about the biology of aging today, what you would do to actually have an impact on health span or, or lifespan. So even if that technology existed, which it doesn't, we're far, far away from having that technology. The, the knowledge isn't there to say, how would you use that technology to actually significantly increase human lifespan? That's where I think there's this disconnect. The people who talk about applying genetic engineering to longevity, are all coming from the technology side and they don't seem to understand that we don't have the biological knowledge about what you would do with that technology right now. Maybe we'll get there. I hope we do, but you need both of those pieces before you can really think about a, a rational design approach to dramatically extending human longevity. Mm -hmm. But what do we know about like the centenarians? So like the people who live to 110 and over yeah. 100 so like do obviously they have like some genetic factors because they're, they're not like biohackers they're not like taking rapamycin or anything right. so they live right. like that long predominantly because of genetics and you know moderately good lifestyle like you know like a decent lifestyle not like a super sometimes lifestyle. although some centenarians you know it's interesting this is and and you know there are people who study this in much more depth than i do so i'm sort of talking as a generalist not as an expert here about centenarian longevity but it's my perception that that there are kind of two classes of centenarians there are the people who like you said you know presumably they have a genetic background that predisposes them to longevity and they practice what would be considered a relatively healthy lifestyle, or they did over, over many, many years. But then there's this class of centenarians who clearly have what we would consider an unhealthy lifestyle, and they have their entire life, and they still make it to exceptional old age. And so, you know, there may actually be a, a couple of different ways that people can achieve exceptional longevity. But I do think it's important to appreciate those people still show functional declines with age. They seem to be able to avoid the things that kill other people. But they're, they're, even the healthiest centenarian is nowhere near as functional as they were when they were 35 years old, right? So they still show functional declines, molecular declines. They're undergoing the biological aging process at least to a largely identical extent as people who don't make it to that exceptional longevity. Then again, I think at this point, we don't really know among centenarians, you know, what percent is genetic, what percent is environmental, and what percent is luck. There is this component, there is this stochastic component as well to making it to, to extreme longevity. Um, and I think 
but 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 getting back to my other point about even if we could modify the human genome in any way we wanted to, we don't know. We can't point to a single gene or a small number of genes that accounts for exceptional longevity in most centenarians, right? So it again, I think the point is it isn't obvious what you would do. We could make some guesses, right? And there are some things we know, like APOE, we would absolutely say, okay, yeah, if you were going to design to the best we can today, somebody who has optimal health span and longevity, we can say, okay, well, we're not gonna have any APOE4 mutations in those people, we'll change that. But it's a relatively small number of, of genetic changes that we would make, and even then, probably best case scenario, you give that person a 30, 40% greater chance of making it past 100. It's not guaranteed, and it's certainly not going to get them to 150. Mm. What about the, like the FOXO3? Uh, those are also like usually yeah. clumped into the centenarian group. Yeah. So there are certain variations in FOXO that are associated with longevity there it's less clear i think that it's causal i think it probably is i mean it's plausible that there's causality there but it's a little bit less clear and again those effect sizes are probably going to be small right so you know maybe if you could design the perfect genotype given what we know today you like i said my intuition and this is a total guess like i can't back this up with math because we don't have the math but it's a but i think it's a pretty reasonable guess you could probably give somebody a 30% better chance of making it to 100 if we made all the genetic changes that we think <laughs> are going to, 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 to slow biological aging in those, those people today. Like we just don't, we just don't have a great understanding yet of what the optimal genetics for longevity are in humans. In mice, so, and again, maybe another way to think about this is just to, to kind of frame it in what we can do in laboratory animals. In mice, you know, we can increase lifespan. I think the biggest is about an 80% increase in lifespan by causing two specific mutations, right? Um, and those are related to growth signaling pathways. So, so you know, the, 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 it's all in that same network with mTOR and growth hormone and IGF-1. Um, nobody's doubled, nobody can routinely double the lifespan of mice. So. So why would you think that we could double the lifespan of people when we can't even do that in mice? You know, it's a it's a stretch. Um, and we don't know that those same mutations in people that extend lifespan in mice are going to extend lifespan in people. In fact, I think there's a reasonable case to be made that if you made them at least early in life, they would they might actually be detrimental in humans. So again, I, I think it's just important to to kind of appreciate, you know, where the science is at. Um, and there's been a lot of progress. But we're not we're not to the point where I think anybody can confidently say that, you know, somebody born today is going to live to be 150 years old. Certainly not where we can say, you know, we're going to hit escape velocity in, in six years. I mean, that's I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying there's no reason to believe that's the case. Right. Yeah. Right now we don't see it <laughs> happening. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, like, what do we know then right now? Like, what is the things that can like if you were to like design the perfect uh, lifestyle and environmental, you know, uh, milieu for the longevity, what, how would that look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And again, I think we have to be honest that there's a lot of guesswork involved. So, so this is where I think it's really useful to differentiate between what we know about longevity and health span in laboratory animals. And of that, what we think is going to translate to people, right? So we've got a lot of, I think, really good data in laboratory animals and in mice in particular that we can reproducibly and robustly increase health span and lifespan um, by modulating things like growth hormone signaling, insulin signaling, IGF-1, uh, and mTOR. Um, and there are a variety of ways we can do that. We can do that through diet, or we can do it genetically, or we can do it with drugs like rapamycin. And we can routinely get, you know, if you're talking about caloric restriction, lifespan extension in the 30 to 50% range, rapamycin lifespan extension in the, you know, 10 to 30% range, depending on dose. So that's that's rock solid. I think it's, a, it's, it's still an open question whether or not those same interventions on average would have similar effects in humans, okay? So in humans, what we know is that Lifestyle is important, that being overweight or particularly being obese 
is reduces your life expectancy. Having metabolic disease reduces your life expectancy. Smoking reduces your life expectancy. Um, not exercising reduces your life expectancy. So we can point to those things. Those things all modulate the same biology of aging that we study in the laboratory. So it's certainly plausible that those things are affecting the biology of aging and the rate of aging. So I think if I was going to design, you know, an optimal lifestyle right now, given what we know, and again, this is a little bit guesswork, different people are going to come up with different answers. I would say, don't be obese. <laughs> um, you know, probably don't want to be super underweight either. I'm not a big believer in, you know, very, very low body weight caloric restriction in humans, but don't be obese. Make sure that you don't have metabolic disease or pre-diabetes, or if you do, take some medication to counteract that. Exercise regularly, maintain function. I tend to believe that maintaining a, a high percentage uh, lean mass is beneficial as we get older. Although I would say the epidemiology there isn't it isn't isn't completely clear. Um, uh, simply because I think most of those studies look at lean body mass. And of course, people who are obese have more lean body mass. So it's, it gets complicated. But I think maintaining a positive body composition. So higher lean mass, lower fat mass as you get older is probably beneficial. Um, maintaining good sleep, right? I mean, again, that's, that's easier said than done. I think we all know that sleep is important. Uh, reducing your chronic stress, uh, not living in a city that has high pollution. I mean, these are all things that are going to intersect to give you the best opportunity for a uh, healthy later years and probably longer lifespan. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I agree with the kind of obesity aspect because it, it, like, if you look at all the centenarians as well, then I don't, I don't think I've ever, or I mean, yet, like rarely are they like overweight or obese. They're usually like a bit thinner and you know, at least in moder moderate uh, weight, but even like then they might might smoke or they might drink alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> like right. I mean, again, I think there's two classes of centenarians, right? <laughs> there's yeah. the ones who who do everything right and the ones who do everything wrong, but still make it that far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, like obesity appears to be like pretty harmful as well. Although like smoking is definitely one of the biggest things that increases your uh, cancer risk. And uh, yeah, it's just if you have like good genes, then you probably... Right. Kind of mitigate some of that risk a little bit but right. yeah, still well and i think also good. you know this is where humans i i don't think are going to be identical to the laboratory animals because there's this whole you know psychological behavioral social component to human health that you know we really can't model in mice in the laboratory right and so you know i think there is this aspect as well of you know feeling fulfilled having relationships um uh, being happy right that that comes into play as well that 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 is that is also going to affect your health span and probably lifespan as you get older and may actually counteract some of the negative what we would consider negative lifestyle behaviors if it brings you joy or social connectedness right so it, it's i mean humans are complicated i think we have to accept that and that's part part of the reason why I also feel like when we do when we see these epidemiological studies, the effect sizes in general are pretty small, right? From these lifestyle interventions, smoking is kind of a counterexample to that, where there's a huge effect size on at least some disease risk factors. But in general, you know, we're not seeing effect sizes that that would translate to forty percent differences in lifespan, right? Even from things like you know high BMI or obesity. Um, you know, the, the, the odds ratios aren't that big. And so I think that's, that's again, just reflecting that, you know, human aging is, is immensely complex and influenced by, you know, the complicated environment that we live in. And in laboratory studies, we take that piece out of the equation, right? So we can really only focus on one thing. Yeah. And, you know, when you, let's say, try to you, you get these results in uh, rats and mice that calorie restriction, 50% or 40% calorie restriction, whatever it is, and they live longer. It's a, yeah, like you see the number, but then you try to implement it into the real world for a human. It's like very <laughs> yeah. hard to actually stick to like a 40% calorie restriction. And uh, yeah, like they're probably the mice are like, you know, very unhappy. They're like very, you know, sad or depressed probably if you were to yeah. try to. Well, it's very different, right? Because they don't have a choice, right? Yeah. So again, that's that's another thing is, you know, first of all, I would say about caloric restriction in humans, right? First of all, there's going to be a huge self-selection on who could even do that. And let's not even say, I mean, 50% is kind of ridiculous, right? Very, 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 very few people would ever be able to do a 50% 
caloric restriction, you know, over many, many years. But even if we talk about moderate caloric restriction, 20%, right? There's already going to be a self-selection for which people could even do that and stick with it, right? Because you've got this chronic sort of uh, uh, self-restraint that has to be there, right? And I think many people are going to feel like they are depriving themselves. And so there's going to be this psychological feedback the mice don't have a choice. So it's kind of like if you were if you were incarcerated and you were forced to, you know, you only could eat what you were given, that would be a sort of a different situation than trying to live in the real world where you're walking down the street past a Dunkin' Donuts or a McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken, whatever, you know, and then you're still trying to do 20% caloric restriction. It's going to be really, really hard for, for most people to even implement that. Yeah. Plus, we don't actually know that that would be net beneficial for for people, at least compared to maintaining a healthy body weight, right? So again, I think I think we can look at the data and say obesity bad on average, healthy body weight versus 20% restriction from there, it's a little bit less clear that there's going to be any additional benefits associated with that caloric restriction. Mm, yeah. And if there is, my gut feeling is it's going to be small. That's the other piece. Is it worth it? That's That's the question I think we have to ask ourselves. Yeah, it's like, you know, the kind of pathways versus epidemiology. So like when you're on calorie restriction, then you stimulate the survival pathways or like, you know, energy conservation pathways and you suppress the growth pathways. But in the real world, you know, uh, you still need to eat. <laughs> you still need to maintain. And in the real world, like the muscle mass is also right. somewhat, you know, important. You don't want to be uh, like underweight uh, either probably. So there, yeah, like it needs to be some sort of a balance. You know, and you're getting exposed to pathogens all the time, which the mice in the lab typically aren't, right? Which could, you know, again, we don't really know whether moderate caloric restriction is going to have a net beneficial or detrimental effect on pathogen exposure. It probably depends on the pathogen, but certainly for at least some pathogens, you know, you may be at a slightly higher risk of an, of an infection. That's probably true for things like rapamycin as well. We haven't talked yet about rapamycin, but, you know, there are probably going to be some trade-offs here that... Um, that could be important as well. And again, I think I think this is another thing most people don't really a, a, always appreciate is, you know, when we do these studies in the laboratory and we talk about caloric restriction, we're talking about the effect on average lifespan across a population of genetically, essentially genetically identical individuals. Um, when you look at things like caloric restriction in different genetic backgrounds, though, you often get very different results. So, and sometimes it shortens lifespan. And so when we, if we were to try to apply caloric restriction in humans who are not clones, right? We're all genetically different, um, all epigenetically different, all environmentally different. There are, it's, it may even increase lifespan on average, but there are gonna be a significant number of people whose lifespan is shortened by that intervention. And, and again, people don't always appreciate, you know, that it's very different when you do these studies and controlled conditions in the laboratory versus trying to bring them out into the real world. Mm. Yeah. Do you happen to know, like, any is, is there any studies done or research on, like, the concentration camp uh, victims? Because they did go through, like, prolonged periods of uh, calorie restriction. Like, how did they their lifespan go? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not an expert in that literature. My my feeling from you know perusing the the literature is that it's sort of a mixed bag. So first of all, you know, again, obviously that's an imperfect um, uh, uh, data set in the sense that you know those people didn't. So when we do caloric restriction in the laboratory, you know, they are supplemented with micronutrients and vitamins. They're not mal the mice aren't malnourished. I think obviously those kinds of human experiences where you had populations like in concentration camps or famines, um, uh, there was no supplementation with vitamins. Like, I mean, they, 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 those people were malnourished at the same time they were calorically restricted. Even still, you can find some evidence if you look for it, that some of those people had longer life expectancies or, or better health outcomes later in life than you might have expected on average. I don't think it's, it's all at all convincing, though, that that was the general feature, right? There, there are probably many, many people, certainly many, many people who went through those experiences who did not have positive future health outcomes and did not live a long time. So it's really hard to know, I think, with any certainty. I think more interestingly there is you can find some pretty good evidence that there are probably epigenetic changes associated with famine and things like that, that get passed on to the next generation and then can affect health outcomes in the next generation. 
Um, again, whether that's a net positive or negative, that's that's harder to disentangle. But it does seem to be the mm-hmm. case that offspring of people who went through a famine do tend to show differential risk factors um, compared to offspring of age match offspring from people who didn't go through a famine, mm. which would support the idea that there are some epigenetic effects of these nutritional interventions and environmental effects that that people experience that that do affect health outcomes in the next generation and yeah. potentially longevity. Yeah, I think I recall like the Dutch famine uh, victims, the offspring of that, I think they had like a high risk of hypothyroidism or obesity. Yeah, or yeah. I, I know there were some connections to obesity and metabolic disease. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, but uh, like food quality. So like you could also be in a color restriction when you're eating like Twinkies and uh, KFC. So uh, right. what's what, what's your thoughts on that? Right. So, I mean, again, I, I, I think I think it's um, I don't know that we have rock solid data to say with 100 percent certainty that a calorically restricted Twinkie diet is probably not good for you. But I think, you know, we can be you know reasonable people and say, yeah, that's probably not that's probably not a good thing. I think the take home is, you know, from the mouse studies, it seems like total calories is important, but those studies are all done under conditions where the mice are at least receiving, you know, uh, uh, minimal uh, nutritional requirements, right? So vitamin and micronutrient supplementation. In that context, I think we can, I think what we can talk about is, you know, carbs versus fat versus protein and ask, is there a difference in terms of the effect on lifespan? The data is a little bit mixed. I think what we can say with some confidence is that restricting all of those things can increase lifespan and and apparently delay aging in mice. Um, Just restricting protein in certain contexts can also increase lifespan in mice. That is probably a slightly different mechanism than Pure caloric restriction, um, and and there are there are some 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 data on that on the potential downstream players from protein restriction. Protein restriction also is probably um, quite dependent on the genetic background of the animals. In other words, it's not going to benefit all genetic backgrounds, but some it seems to have a positive effect. So protein is maybe a little bit unique, uh, but we do know that you can restrict across the board calories and get lifespan extension. There's a little bit of data on uh, carbohydrate restriction and ketogenic diet. The effects there are pretty small on lifespan in mice. Um, Health span metrics look a little bit more convincing. Absolute lifespan from ketogenic diet is very, very small positive effect compared to caloric restriction, which is a large positive uh, positive effect. So, you know, that, I would say the studies the in animals support the idea that total calories is mostly what's important. Gotcha. So in, in the keto diet, there was no calorie restriction or or with calorie restriction? So, so they were smaller. They were smaller. So this is where it gets a little bit hard. And protein restriction falls into this category as well. Depending on um, the study you look at, sometimes mice that are protein restricted will actually eat more total calories than mice that are getting the control diet, but they're just not able to use them, right? That that appears to be the case, even with, I think, some methionine restriction studies or sulfur amino acid restriction studies. Um, so I, So in those cases, I don't know that we can draw a direct correlation between food consumption and actual bioavailability of the, the nutrients. Um, so what I can say is, and this is, this is, I think, again, there's a little bit of misunderstanding out there in the literature is when we look at the caloric restriction studies, people have tried to do um, time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting experiments um, where they've tried to control for calories. In other words, if you think about intermittent fasting, and, and I'm just going to define that as um, uh, not eating for 24 hours or more. Okay, so I would say time-restricted feeding is compressing the time within a 24 hour period that you eat all your calories. Fasting is not eating for 24 hours or more. Okay. So people have done both those experiments in mice, time restricted feeding and intermittent fasting. When you don't control for calories, you can get lifespan extension from those studies, but they're always calorically restricted. When you do control for calories, in other words, when you make sure that the mice that are intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding are eating the same number of calories 
there's little to no effect on lifespan. It's tiny to zero, depending on the study you look at. So again, I think that supports the idea that total calories is really what's most important, at least in mice, not when you eat those calories or how often you eat those calories. The one thing that that is, I think, um, interesting there though, is that uh, if you, in in mice, if you decouple the circadian component of when they eat on caloric restriction, you do lose some of the benefits. So, so it's almost as if caloric restriction is necessary for the lifespan extension, but it's not sufficient. You also need this circadian component of when you eat. Another way to say it is, if you want, if you're a mouse and you want to get the benefit from caloric restriction, you have, first of all, have to be the right genotype. You have to eat less calories, but it is important on when you eat those less calories. If you're a mouse and you're not calorically restricted, it doesn't seem to matter when you eat those calories. Hopefully that made sense. It's The literature is complicated here. And unfortunately, the studies aren't always well controlled or well interpreted. Yeah. Yeah. So like in, in, uh, in the mice, the circadian component is that for them, the active phases at night. So the, for them to get the health benefits for longevity benefits, they have to eat at night, but in humans, they have to eat at daytime. Like, Yeah. I mean, it's different in that sense. So I don't know that we would want to try to extrapolate to humans in any way, but also when the mice are calorically restricted and this kind of makes sense, right? You give them the food, they're going to eat it right away. Right. So it's not as though they're just munching all day long. They're hungry. You give them the food, they eat they eat right away. In fact, if you go back and look at the early caloric or maybe mid mid stage caloric restriction literature, I'm talking about stuff from Walford and, and Weindrick in the 80s and the 90s. You know, in those studies, the mice were calorically restricted and intermittent fasted, so they really only got fed three times a week, and they ate their food right away. So, so what people have done is, and this there aren't too many studies on this. This is pretty new stuff. But what people have done is they take the same total calories, they calorically restrict the mice, but they just give them a little bit at a time, right? So they can't eat it all right away. And that seems to cause a little bit of a reduction in the benefits that the mice get in terms of longevity from being calorically restricted. So it's almost as if you need both the fast and the caloric restriction to get the full benefits, which, you know, isn't shocking, I guess, on it, on, on, it, on the surface, but it, the data support that idea. Yeah, and uh, the uh, the length of the fast is still like crucial. So that time restricted eating doesn't probably have that effect. It's just a way to like control calorie intake. Like the like you said, intermittent fasting is something beyond twenty four hours. Yeah, again, this is where I think we do have to be careful and honest about the fact that that you know we don't know that what's seen in mice is going to extrapolate to people or how well it's going to extrapolate to people. So yes, I think we can say in mice time-restricted feeding in the absence of caloric restriction doesn't do much. There might, I mean, there's going to be some metabolic effects and things like that. Longevity, probably no effect. The same with intermittent fasting, a tiny longevity effect, maybe at best case. Um, is that, does that mean that, you know, intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding in people aren't going to have any effect? I don't know. I mean, I, I think we, we can't, we can't have a lot of certainty just based on the, on the mouse studies. Um, I mean, I think for some people, for sure, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding is a very, very useful way to maintain a healthier body weight. So in that context, it's probably, I mean, again, if the choice is, you know, obesity versus healthy body weight through time-restricted feeding, my intuition is that healthy body weight through time-restricted feeding is probably better. And so I would say for, if that's what, if that's a strategy that, that people find useful, great, but I would not feel comfortable or confident saying that's a good longevity strategy. There isn't much evidence to support the idea that intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding in people is pro-longevity. Other than help maintaining a healthy body weight. <laughs> well, again, we don't, we don't actually have data to support that. I am speculating <laughs> that for some people, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding is a useful strategy for maintaining a healthy body weight and preventing obesity. I don't think we actually have long-term epidemiology yet to demonstrate that. So, you know, it seems reasonable, but I don't know that the data is there to really, you know, save with, with 100% certainty. Again, you know, this is where we get back to the idea that the, the people are, you know, we're complicated and the short-term effects of a certain dietary strategy. And I'm going to, I'm going to 
put time restricted feeding and intermittent fasting under that umbrella as a dietary strategy. The short term effects, I think for sure, some people will lose body weight using those strategies. Will they maintain that lower body weight in the long term? Uh, not everybody will. Again, I'm pretty confident about that. But on average, I don't know. I don't think we know at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, what about different these calorie restriction mimetics? So are there like supplements and uh, pharmaceuticals that can mimic the calorie restriction effects? And yeah, like rapamycin is one of them. Right. So, so here's what I would say. I, I would say, you know, caloric restriction um, from a biological perspective is a gigantic hammer. And what I mean by that is it has tens of thousands of effects in within cells in terms of, you know, gene expression, enzyme activity, metabolite levels. It changes massive amounts of, of the biology of cells. There are absolutely small molecules that can mimic pieces of that. I don't know of anything that is a 100% caloric restriction mimetic from a drug perspective. The only thing that's 100% caloric restriction mimetic that I, it's not even a caloric restriction mimetic because it's caloric restriction. In other words, there is nothing that can do everything that caloric restriction does exactly the same way be, other than caloric restriction. But we do have some things that will mimic parts of caloric restriction. And, and one of those is rapamycin. So rapamycin is a drug that inhibits a protein called mTOR, which stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin. And caloric restriction turns down mTOR. So the drug is making mTOR activity go in the same direction as caloric restriction. Now, it turns out that mTOR is, is kind of a central node in the cellular network that responds to nutrients. And, and why I say that and why it's important is because it's that kind of central control point, a lot of the downstream effects of caloric restriction are funneled through mTOR. And so that means that rapamycin actually mimics a lot of the downstream consequences of caloric restriction, but it's not everything. So I say that rapamycin is overlapping, but distinct with caloric restriction. Now, in terms of longevity, Rapamycin increases lifespan in mice. Caloric restriction increases lifespan in mice. They're overlapping. So it's a reasonable hypothesis, which I think is backed up by a fair amount of data, that the mechanisms by which rapamycin is extending lifespan is similar, maybe not identical, but similar to the mechanisms by which caloric restriction is extending lifespan. So in that context, yes, we do have some partial caloric restriction mimetics, but we don't have anything that will you know, completely recapitulate caloric restriction. You could argue some of these new anti-obesity drugs like the, the GLP-1 agonists do that, but they do that because they make people not eat as much, right? So again, it's not mimicking caloric restriction, it's inducing caloric restriction. Yeah, yeah, it's mimicking not eating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, it's causing you to not eat as much, yes. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, so rapamycin, uh, it's, I think it's one of the most kind of known like uh, longevity supplements uh, or you know, pharmaceuticals uh, out there. So uh, yeah, we can talk about like, what are the like longevity benefits in other animals of it? Sure. Yeah. So I think um, uh, one thing to say about rapamycin, so I'm, I already mentioned rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR, mechanistic target of rapamycin. So, so one thing we know from laboratory studies, this work started, you know, about 2004, I think was the first paper um, and has gone through today. We know that you can increase lifespan in every model organism where this has been attempted. So yeast, nematode worms, fruit flies, mice, uh, either genetically by, by knocking down mTOR, by manipulating the mTOR gene or other things in that pathway, or pharmacologically by treating those organisms with rapamycin. So, and, and the reason why I think it's useful to make that explicit point is just to emphasize how strong and large the body of literature on mTOR and rapamycin is in the field. Second to caloric restriction, I would say there is nothing in terms of effects on longevity that has been as robust and reproducible as inhibiting mTOR either genetically or pharmacologically. So that's rock solid. In mice, I think a couple of things that are important to appreciate about rapamycin is one, you can start the treatment in middle age still get most, if not all of the benefits in terms of lifespan. So that's been shown starting at 20 months of age, um, which is about the mouse equivalent of a 65 year old person. 
uh, and comparing that to starting at six months or nine months of age. You essentially get the same effect on lifespan or close from starting in middle age. Um, even short-term treatments in middle age of about three months are enough to give most of the longevity benefits. And, and that's work from my lab. Other people have done the same thing where you start at uh, 20 months, you stop the treatment at 23 months, and you still see the big effect on lifespan. And then the other piece here that I think is really important to appreciate is we can't point to just one thing like cancer and say, that's why the mice are living longer. Indeed, the mice are getting fewer cancers, at least when you control for age, but they're also showing maintained function in every, pretty much every tissue and organ where people have looked. The function is maintained later into old age. And importantly now, in, in at least I think four different tissues, we can actually see if you start treating an old mouse with rapamycin, function gets better. So that's been seen in the heart, it's been seen in the immune system, it's been seen in the oral cavity, and it's been seen in the ovaries. So you can take an old mouse, already see functional declines that you can detect, and short-term treatment with rapamycin of between six and 10 weeks is enough to restore that function back, either partly back to a youthful state, or in some cases, all the way back to a youthful state. So that's very encouraging, again, from a translational perspective, trying to take this out of the laboratory, because obviously it's much easier to think about a clinical trial where you might actually see an improvement in function in the elderly, as opposed to just trying to detect a, a change in the slope of decline. Mm. Yeah, so are there like any human studies as well? Uh, like what do they usually prescribe rapamycin for and are there any studies about it? Right, so there's lots of clinical data on rapamycin. Um, it, it goes under the name serolimus in the clinical literature. So it's exactly, exactly the same molecule but it has two different names. Um, so, so rapamycin or serolimus was, it's been FDA approved for more than 20 years. It was first developed in clinical medicine as an organ transplant drug. So that's where we have most of the data uh, are from uh, organ transplant patients um, who have been given rapamycin to prevent the organ rejection. So it's commonly referred to as an immune suppressant in the clinical literature. It's also been approved for a few other uh, indications um, in uh, cardiac stents for certain forms of cancer, for certain diseases like tuberous sclerosis, where these people have hyperactivation of mTOR due to a mutation, but most of the literature is gonna be in organ transplant patients. Um, so if you go to a physician and you ask them about rapamycin, they're probably not gonna know what that is because they've never heard of it called rapamycin. If you ask them about serolimus, if they know anything about serolimus, they're gonna think of it as a immunosuppressant because of the way it was developed clinically. So in that context, these are people taking pretty high doses of, of rapamycin daily. Um, and there are a lot of side effects that go along with taking rapamycin in that context. Um, they aren't typically life-threatening, but they're you know uncomfortable to potentially raising the risk of, of some severe adverse events. So the most common side effect is mouth sores, um, high triglycerides also is pretty common. Uh, something that, that people call pseudo diabetes. So glucose dysregulation, um, and increased risk of infection you would expect. So those are the things that people are going to be worried about, uh, for serolimus in the context of organ transplant patients. We are starting now to get some data on rapamycin or rapamycin derivatives in other patient populations that are not organ transplant patients taking other immunosuppressants and high doses of rapamycin. It's pretty early, um, but I think we can say with some level of confidence that the risk associated with rapamycin use in people who are not organ transplant patients is much lower. Um, the side effect profile is pretty benign, actually. There have been a couple of phase two clinical trials on a derivative of rapamycin for immune function in the elderly, at least at the lower doses tested there, the side effects are pretty comparable to placebo. So it's not really clear that there were significant side effects and some evidence for improvements in flu vaccine response and uh, subsequent risk of, of uh, upper respiratory tract infection. So maybe some evidence for beneficial effects on immune function, similar to what has been seen in mice, but the data are pretty sparse right now. So, mm. um, so we don't have a lot. I've been involved in a project where we've been collecting survey data from people using rapamycin off-label. So the, the sort of biohacker crowd, so to speak. Um, and again, there, the data, the paper's under uh, revision now, 
So hopefully it'll be published soon. The data there, I think, are pretty consistent with the clinical trials that I mentioned, at least in the sense that we didn't really find any evidence for higher um, experiences of what we would consider potential side effects of rapamycin other than mouth sores. That was the one thing that looked different between the people who'd been using rapamycin and the people who'd never used rapamycin. We didn't find any evidence for any other side effects in the, the rapamycin user group in that study. So I think we can be pretty confident that it's relatively safe uh, at the sort of doses that we might, that might have benefits for health span and longevity in people. But again, it's small, imperfect data sets. We really need some some well-controlled, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials to, to know with confidence. And fortunately, those are, are starting to happen. So I think, you know, we'll have a lot more information in the next few years. Mm. Yeah. I, I know you're also doing like a dog rapamycin uh, study or a right. project. So like, <laughs> you can talk about that as well. Sure. Yeah. So that's part of what we call the dog aging project. Um, dog aging project is a large what we call longitudinal study of aging in pet dogs. So these are all dogs living with their owners. That's important because these now are dogs that are in the human environment, right? Um, so these are all companion dogs, pet dogs living with their owners. The biggest part of the dog aging project is this longitudinal study. So it's non, it's not a clinical trial. It's observational. We're just following the dogs over time, trying to understand what are the most important genetic and environmental factors that influence health outcomes during aging in dogs. About 45,000, almost 45,000 dogs in that study right now. Um, but we do also have a smaller clinical trial. So this is a true veterinary clinical trial, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial of rapamycin with the goal of determining does rapamycin increase lifespan and improve health span metrics in pet dogs. So 580 dogs, once we're fully subscribed, will be enrolled in that trial. Half get rapamycin, half get placebo. It's a one-year treatment period, two-year follow-up. Um, lifespan is the primary endpoint. So we are statistically powered to detect a 9% change in lifespan. Um, but as I mentioned, we are obviously very interested in health span metrics. So we're looking, you know, as broadly as we reasonably can at health span measures during aging in dogs. So for secondary endpoints, we have heart function by echocardiogram, neurological function by a neurological exam, activity, cancer incidents, kidney disease incidents, things like that. Um, you know, to, to really try to understand is rapamycin having a positive effect on health as these dogs are, are aging. We're also looking at, as exploratory endpoints, a few molecular markers of interest like epigenetic changes. So it's a lot of interest in the field right now in the possibility of building biomarkers of aging, epigenetic clocks, metabolomic clocks, things like that. So we're measuring uh, blood epigenome, blood metabolome, and fecal microbiome on all the dogs in the rapamycin trial as well. Mm, wow, <laughs> that's a lot of and very thorough. Uh, interesting, like uh, that you would, uh, you know, like do dogs need also placebo <laughs> or? Well, yeah, I mean, I think again, if you want to, if you really want to convince people, right? Part, part of this is, you know, really trying to understand in as rigorous a way as possible whether rapamycin is having positive effects. And I think that, you know, clinical trials are the gold standard for obvious reasons. And so it made sense to, um, to design this as a very rigorous clinical trial. Sure, the dogs aren't going to know whether they're getting rapamycin or not, but the owners could. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why, I mean, we, you know, sort of half jokingly, I call it a triple blind trial. Mm. We don't know, the owners don't know, and the dogs don't know. Um, but the, if the owners did know, you could imagine that could actually affect the outcome of the study, right? If the owners knew whether their dog was getting placebo or rapamycin, they might treat the dog differently. They might do different things. So, so yeah. I think it makes sense from that perspective to do this in a blinded way um, and to really do it at the highest possible standards uh, that, that we can. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I was just joking a bit, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So like you mentioned the epigenetic uh, clocks and uh, you need the people use them to like show that their biological age is younger than their uh, chronological age and I have done that as well like it showed that was like nine years uh, younger <laughs> than, yeah. than my cr chronological age so uh, yeah like maybe you can talk about that are, are they like accurate do they actually predict like you know actual biological age or or do they have any effect on like mortality risk or life expectancy at all <laughs> 
Right. Really good question. So, so I think the first thing I would say is epigenetic clocks are not measuring biological age, at least as anybody who understands the science of aging would define biological age. They're measuring a piece of biological age. If you, you know, to the extent that we accept the hallmarks of aging as telling us something about the biology of aging, epigenetic changes are just one of the nine to 11 hallmarks of aging, depending on who you ask. So there is really very little reason to believe that epigenetic clocks are any more or less informative about the biology of aging than telomere length, if you could measure it uh, quantitatively, senescent cell burden, mitochondrial functional assays, right? They are part of the biology of aging. They are not the biology of aging as a whole. They're also, it's not clear to me that epigenetic clocks are going to be more informative than functional measures we could use that are relevant for aging or certainly more relevant for health, like grip strength or walk speed in, in the elderly. So I think I think what we have to recognize is these epigenetic clocks are measuring one piece of the biology of aging. And we don't know how informative that is about other pieces of the biology of aging. And it's not clear that it's any more informative than other things that we could measure. Um, but I do think it is part of the biology of aging. So I think it is telling you something about your sort of overall biological aging process. Um, is it predictive for future health outcomes and mortality? We don't know yet. So what we can say is what we do know is that if you look in longitudinal studies in humans, you can develop epigenetic signatures that when you look at the same sample from the same people at two different times are predictive for future health outcomes in those people. Okay. But those are always going to be specific to that population, number one. And number two, that population is probably, most of these longitudinal studies are going to be a cross-section of the average American population. And I think that's important, again, or, or other countries, it doesn't have to be from America, obviously. But I think that's important for people who want to use these epigenetic clocks or other biological aging clocks to inform them about their own health. You know, you personally are not you probably don't fit into the 50th percentile of the average population. So the epigenetic signature that was predictive for the average population may or may not tell you anything relevant about your future health outcomes. And I think that's really important for people to appreciate. We just don't know yet that these things are actually going to be predictive. And most of the biohacker crowd, honestly, is going to be at the higher end of the lifestyle health spectrum compared to the average population. We have no idea whether those same epigenetic signatures in that population are going to, to be predictive for future health outcomes in that population. It's yeah. certainly plausible that they will be. And I think they I think they probably are telling you something about your current health status. But you know, I would be very, very careful about um yeah. about overinterpreting or getting too much confidence in those tests. The other there's two other things I would say about these biological or the epigenetic tests in particular. We don't really yet have much information on what the variation looks like on these direct to consumer tests. So I don't know if you've done this, but I know people who've taken the same test two or three times and they get plus or minus 10 years, right? Within a within a couple of weeks or a couple of months period. So we don't really know what the variance looks like on, on these tests. Um, and honestly, we don't really know what these companies are doing. All we know is what they're telling us. Like, how do you know what they actually did with your sample? How do you know that they actually ran the assay that you expected that they ran? I'm not saying that they didn't. Like, I have no reason to believe that these companies are being dishonest, but I also have no real reason to trust them, right? So, so how do you know that these things are actually being analyzed in the way that, so these clocks were all built off of academic literature, right? Where I think we can at least have some expectation that the scientists were actually doing the experiments that they wrote up in the paper. So again, I don't think consumers necessarily realize the information that they may be giving to these companies by sending in your samples. And again, most of these companies aren't regulated right now. So you know, I, I I at least think people should be aware of that. I'm not a I'm not a conspiracy theorist guy. I'm not again, I I'm not personally worried about sending in my own samples, but you know, people get so worried about health, proprietary health information and and privacy and all of that, and yet they're perfectly happy to, happy to send away their genome and their prior drug use history and all that stuff. 
in these samples that they're sending to these companies where there's really no regulation. So I think people should at least think about that as they're making decisions, whether or not they want to use these, these sorts of uh, direct-to-consumer biological aging tests. I think if you look at it as a fun exercise, that's fine. I wouldn't put a whole lot of confidence that these tests are telling you something fundamental about your, your biology of aging. Or I certainly wouldn't, you know, if you feel like you're if you feel like you've got a healthy lifestyle and you've made healthy lifestyle changes and the epigenetic test tells you something different, I certainly wouldn't change your healthy lifestyle based on an epigenetic test. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you have good biomarkers and you're, you know, in good health, then uh, you would expect the biological age to be lower as well. And uh, I mean, if it is higher than the probably test. Yeah. And there was like actually one recent study that showed that it fluctuates based on like if you had like some illness or inflammation or so like even right. COVID can raise your this test result so you're older biologically from the test and then it goes back to normal so it you know depends right. on when you take it as well like have you been sick recently have you had like some bacterial infection and that makes sense right because because yeah. these tests are all blood te well except for the, the 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 oral swab tests which are relatively new these tests have all been blood tests right so they're looking at immune cell populations and there's some work um, I've seen Eric Verdon uh, from the Buck Institute present on work from his lab, right, where they make a case that the epigenetic tests are can be dominated by certain immune cell subtypes, which are going to change over time if you have an infection. So I think that certainly is a is a reasonable explanation for why you might see these, you know, very short time period changes that can drive large changes in the uh, the epigenetic. The, the epigenetic age number that you get back yeah yeah and yeah i agree like the bio just the blood work is probably more you know important because that's what you know that's what actually determines like the disease risk like are you going to get diabetes or are you going to get heart disease or something like that based on the blood work is it kind of more important yeah i don't know Let, let's unpack that for a minute because i don't know that it's more important necessarily they're both bio they're both measuring different aspects of biology. I think what we can say about the blood work is we have a much longer history with those parameters. So we know better what the at least correlative changes are, right? Uh, in, in terms of risk modification, um, you know, which is more important. I think we don't, we don't necessarily know in a few exceptional cases where we can specifically map a blood chemistry marker to a specific organ dysfunction, there we can infer causality. But in general, I don't know that we can necessarily infer causality from blood chemistry any more than we can from, from epigenetic changes. It's just that we know we've had, a, we've got a lot longer history and a lot, lot more data on uh, blood chemistry parameters. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, so yeah, like, and is it, is it possible to like, you know, um, because like the recently David Sinclair also had this at least I glanced at like the paper where the mouse or oh, sorry the monkey was uh they got the vision back and I think they did it with the mice as well a few years ago right. something like that so is it possible to like reverse these uh aging related changes um and yeah like is it possible to like reverse aging itself as well so again I think um we need to be clear about what has actually been shown in the literature and what has been claimed because <laughs> the claims are dishonest i'll just say it they're dishonest so so what we can what we can say with confidence i don't know if aging can be reversed or not biological aging like as a whole can be can be reversed i think you know certainly we have to say it's theoretically possible will uh epigenetic reprogramming reverse biological aging as a whole there's no evidence to support that yet in an animal um it, it all really depends on what the what the uh, hierarchy of hallmarks of aging are. So if epigenetic reprogramming can reverse biological aging, it has to be the case that epigenetic changes are upstream of everything else, right? Then if you fix that, if you reverse those, maybe you can reverse everything else. There's no real evidence to support that at this point. Um, what has been shown is that you can partially epigenetically reprogram a small number of tissue types in mice and partially restore function, okay? 
You can do the same thing with rapamycin. This I think is where there's a big disconnect. There's actually better data in mice that you can reverse functional declines, pathological states with rapamycin than there is currently for partial epigenetic reprogramming. I already mentioned heart, immune system, oral cavity, ovaries, some evidence in the brain even that you can reverse functional declines and pathology with short-term treatment with rapamycin. Nobody's claiming that we've reversed aging or that we've made an old mouse young again with rapamycin. So the hype has gotten way, way ahead of what the data actually show with epigenetic reprogramming. Personally, I think it is dishonest and misleading to talk about reversing aging at this point. Again, is it possible that someday somebody will show that you can use epigenetic reprogramming and turn an old mouse or maybe someday an old person into a young mouse or a young person? Sure, that's possible. There's, there's no real reason to believe that's going to happen, um, but certainly it hasn't happened yet. So again, I think we just have to be, we should be honest about what, what the data actually show. And yeah, I think the epigenetic reprogramming has a lot of promise. I would love to see it be therapeutically useful for certain degenerative disorders in the eye or elsewhere in the body in the future. I think we're a ways away from that. I think, you know, that's another conversation about, you know, what would it take from a regulatory perspective before a body like the FDA is going to approve something like partial epigenetic reprogramming in humans? I think we're a ways away from that, but there's a lot of potential there for certain disorders. I don't yet see much evidence that it's going to fundamentally, you know, reverse aging or change the way we understand the biology of aging. I'd love to, I'd love for that to be the case, but so far we're not there. Mm. Yeah. I guess like when, um, you know, even, even like Brian Johnson and uh, others like talking about reversing aging, I guess they're mean, meaning, or I don't, they, they mean like, yeah, like reversing aging, but what the actual outcome is that they just like revert their life expectancy back to a higher set point. Well, maybe were, there's no they're... evidence for that, right? Though, I mean, again, this is where it might be true. I think, it, I mean, again, you, you, so, so I think if you want to define exercise as reversing aging, then, then, okay, then we can have no, it's, that. It's just, it's just that, right? let's say the, overweight brian johnson would have a life expectancy of maybe like i don't know 75 or 65 but then, then now fit, fit brian johnson might have yeah. like a few extra years so that's sure. reverse engaging but it's not actually reverse engaging he's not reversing his bio biology aging side he's just increasing his life expectancy <laughs> yeah and I, I do so so again i think you know this this is getting to be a little bit of a semantic <laughs> uh. discussion right which is necessary because we're talking about definitions but here's what I would say. You, you absolutely can reverse aspects of biological aging, right? Again, it, there are all sorts of phenotypes, right? So phenotype, I think, you know, that, 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 that word is sort of a, a term maybe not everybody's familiar with, but, you know, it's just a trait, right? There are all sorts of changes that go along with getting old, right? Your hair gets gray, your skin gets wrinkled, you lose muscle mass, um, you say you have changes in phenotypes at the cellular and molecular level as well. Those are the hallmarks of aging. There are millions of things that change with age. And if you do certain interventions, you can reverse some of those, right? So again, I think exercise is a great example. You can reverse a lot of the trait changes that go along with aging with exercise, but you're not going to reverse everything. The best athletes in the world still get old, right? They, they, they still get wrinkles. And, you know, they don't have life expectancies that much longer than everybody else, maybe 10 years. So you can do that with rapamycin, at least in mice. You can do that with epigenetic reprogramming, at least in mice. You can do that with, you know, sort of extreme uh, lifestyle modifications like Brian Johnson. Um, and you can see some reversals. Did, did do, we, do we really believe that he got younger, that he went from being old to young? I don't. I mean, if people want to believe that, they're welcome to, but I, I mean, it seems sort of ridiculous to me. Um, so, so again, I don't view it as fundamentally any different than somebody who's has never exercised, starting to exercise, lifting weights, walking, running, you know, they're going to look better and they're going to functionally get better, but they didn't get younger by, I mean, maybe they didn't get younger biologically, I guess is, is what I would say. Um, they didn't reverse their aging process as a whole. And again, you know, I, I get, I get that some people think it's okay to use words in 
a way that that gets a lot of attention. But personally, I feel like it's deceptive and it misleads people. And and I try to push back against that. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't think he, he it's possible or he reversed his biological age. Uh... Or he reversed obviously the number number, but he didn't like actually reverse his the the age of his biology, like the body. It's a, it's just yeah. he's like a you know a much healthier forty five year old than he was before. <laughs> At least by the biomarkers that they're measuring, yes, I think yeah. that's right. I think again though, you know, um, I mentioned before, you know, there there are stochastic pieces to whether you live a long life. I think again in in humans, it's super complicated, right? The the question of whether or not a very extreme lifestyle modification where you try to optimize everything is actually going to lead to the desired outcome, right? And, and you know, is it sustainable in the long run? What are the psychological consequences to that kind of behavior? You know, those are all questions that I think, you know, I've heard people raise and I think they're legitimate, right? And, you know, if you look at people, you know, there's a long history of this in this field, actually. When I was a graduate student, there was this um, group called the Calorie Restriction Society, right, which are are people who were self-practicing caloric restriction. And I think it was apparent to anybody who interacted with with them, first of all, there's a self-selection, but there was also a lot of um a lot of people on there who had eating disorders who, you know, that's that society has sort of died out, but who I'm guessing went on either to not be able to maintain that lifestyle or to actually have adverse health outcomes because of that sort of extreme lifestyle. I think the, you know, we can also look to historical examples of people who had very, very extreme lifestyle um, approaches. Roy Walford is, is a classic example. I don't know if you're familiar with, with Roy's work, but you know, he was one of the early pioneers in the caloric restriction literature. He and Rick Weindrick did a bunch of the uh, rodent caloric restriction work that, that really was foundational and, and set the stage for what we know today. Um, uh, and he very much became a proponent of caloric restriction. He wrote a book called The 120-Year Diet about caloric restriction, and, and he kind of started the caloric restriction movement, you know, and then he died from a neurological disorder, I think, in his 70s or, or early 80s. So, you know, it, it's, really not, it's really not clear that the sort of very, very extreme adoption of uh, attempting to optimize lifestyle is actually going to achieve the goal. And so I, you know, my view is let's be a little bit more pragmatic and, and, uh, and, you know, try to avoid the extremes on either side. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I mean, the irony is that you go on this low calorie and low protein diet, for example, that's always very common, but then you yeah. like die to a hip fracture or something like that. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> double. Yeah. Again, I think this is really interesting and, you know, I, I, I've, I've been pretty, uh, public about my own sort of personal belief on this. Like I don't, I don't think low protein is a great idea. I am very much a believer that that resistance training and and maintaining uh, a, a positive body composition, meaning higher lean body mass, lower fat mass as you get older, is beneficial at least for function. I think for mortality, it's it's harder because the effect sizes are small and the epidemiology is complicated. But yeah, I would agree with you. I believe that that is a a uh, better health span strategy than low protein caloric restriction, uh, very, very lean, uh, very, very low body fat, but low lean body mass. And it is my speculation that those people are going to be at a higher risk of frailty as they get older. I don't know that that's 100% true, but um, but functionally, I'm pretty confident that at least for me, I want to be able to maintain function and do the activities of daily life that I want to do as I get older. And I think, you know, being strong is part of that. So I'm not a big believer in low protein or very, very low calorie diets. Mm, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Definitely. You know, like the health span is quite critical as well. And um, if you like focus on the health span, then uh, yeah, like it, it, you know, obviously both make you healthier and, uh, you know, theoretically it can also, yeah, just, you know, increase your life expectancy like but it doesn't like slow down or you know you're still aging and you will still die at some point but uh, right. yeah that's like, what i was gonna say i think i think we have to appreciate that that regardless the effects on mortality aren't going to be huge right so again i think if we look at people who are at the very unhealthy edge of the spectrum which unfortunately is at least in the united states is the average person to some extent i think those people can almost all get 15 years of quality life back just by lifestyle modification. But for people who are already in the relatively healthy range, we're probably not talking 
a lifespan effect that's huge, right? But I certainly think you can have a you can still have a pretty big impact on your functionality and quality of life into the the later years. And so, you know, that's at least right now where I tend to focus most of my personal attention is, you know, how do I maintain functionality as long as possible? Mm, yeah, and make sure you don't get like the metabolic diseases and uh, right. avoid dying from something else. Yeah. <laughs> right, which could be metabolic disease, but also, you know, other, there's a lot of risky lifestyle habits that, you know, we could partake in if we really wanted to. Yeah, yeah, like, like, you know, wearing a helmet when you're motorcycling is it like must right. pretty much or bicycle bicycling as well. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, this was a very fun and exciting and uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to like the dog study. That's something that I was like always wondering, like, why wouldn't we just give dogs and different animals uh, who are already like, you know, uh, who, you know, most people want their pet to live a little bit longer. So yeah, like, why not try <laughs> to test like some rapamycin or something like that? So yeah, looking yeah, forward and, like that. And I think, you know, one of the great things about, I mean, it's, it's one of the one of the sad things about dogs is they age so rapidly, right? So anybody who's ever had a dog, you know, knows the pain of losing that family member. But the fact that they age so rapidly means that we can actually study the biology of aging and potentially demonstrate whether something like rapamycin can have an effect in a reasonable time frame. So, you know, I think there are huge opportunities in the companion animal space and in the longevity field to actually get answers much more quickly than we can in in people. So, yeah, I guess just to finish up, I'll, I will make a plea to anybody who's listening. If you have a dog and you want to participate in uh, a groundbreaking scientific project in the biology of aging, go to dogagingproject.org, nominate your dog to participate in, in the project. We are absolutely still recruiting and enrolling dogs in, into the project, all ages, all sizes, all genetic backgrounds. Um, we would love to have you participate in the project. Awesome. Yeah. Where, where was the website or? Dogagingproject.org. Okay. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, before I ask my last question, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, so probably the best place to, to learn about me is uh, on Twitter at mkaberline. Um, uh, my webpage is uh, kaberlinelab.org, although that is undergoing some changes right now as I undergo some changes. So more more to come soon, um, but uh, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. So if you're, if you're really interested, um, I, I won't be hard to find. Nice. We'll uh, yeah, put the links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Mm. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, there are a lot. I would say I'd say a couple, right? So I say I finally feel like I'm at a I'm at a place where I have figured out um, a physical exercise routine that I'm confident I can stick with for the long run. And so I think that's that's maybe the biggest piece of advice is to, 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 I think too many people try to focus on what they think they should do to get healthy instead of focusing on what is something I can do that I can sustain over decades, right? It doesn't have to be the same thing. You can obviously change it over time, but, but maintaining health is not going to be an overnight fix. And so, so finding strategies that you can apply over the long term to, to be healthy, I think is hard but it is absolutely worth the investment. So I wish that I had done that sooner and I wish that I had focused on that sooner. The other thing I would say is focus on being happy. That's another thing I wish that I had focused on sooner. I think too many people don't think enough about happiness and they think too much about all the other stuff and all the other stuff, if you're unhappy, you know, maybe doesn't matter so much. Mm, yeah. But and, think about and... Think about happiness every day. Yeah, and it doesn't matter how long you live if you're unhappy. <laughs> that's right. At least not. I, I'd rather be happy than miserable. That's for yeah. sure. I think that's called hell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's something we don't talk about a lot, honestly, right? I think we don't pay as much attention to that, in part because it's harder, right? It's easier to say, okay, here's what you should eat. Here's what you should do physically. It's harder to give sort of general recommendations to people on 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 how to be happy. Mm, yeah, but it's worth well, thinking about. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's been very fun and uh, awesome podcast. So we will probably do another one in the future or something. Like that. Sounds great. Good talking to you. You too. Do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to do just that. 
If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want to support this podcast, then check out our sponsors and leave a review on iTunes or Spotify. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.